Okay, so good morning everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this presentation and uh, thanks to my advisor Dr. Amish Chek for uh, giving me this opportunity to present and my rest of the committee members, Dr. Prashad, uh, Dr. Stalin who is uh, in remote, um, she is a cognitive scientist and Dr. Kalra, he is a pediatrician from Dutton Children Hospital and he is also our clinical collaborator in our health asthma team. So yeah, feel free to take the refreshment uh, before I start, or whenever you feel like. So the outline of my presentation, I'll start with the introduction, where I'll be discussing about the background of my problem, challenges, and some related works. Then I'll move into uh, methodology, where I'll be discussing about my approach and uh, my implementation detail. Then we'll move into some eva preliminary evaluations and result. Um, then I'll conclude my work with some future work and discussion. So starting with asthma, it's a chronic pulmonary disease affecting more than 26 million people in the United States, out of which 6.1 million are children. Uh, it's a multifactorial disease, meaning uh, uh, different patients react differently to the same asthma triggers. And it can be really serious if not well managed, or even life threatening in some of the cases. And according to CDC, it is one of the most chronic pediatric conditions accounting for, uh, yeah, responsible for 13.8 million missed school days per year. So, since it's a chronic disease, since this is a chronic disease, we cannot cure it for, a, you know, cure it, it, live, it lives throughout the life of the patient, but we can manage it or a patient can try to self-manage it so that they can lead a normal life like a healthy person. So what is asthma self-management? So these are strategies to help patients to uh, better manage their asthma and to deal with their asthma in their daily life so as to lead a normal life. So these are the four key challenges we need to address to achieve the self-management. Tracking of asthma, that is asthma symptoms and signs, ensuring medical adherence, uh, avoiding environmental triggers, and self-management education. Let's look into each of these. So in order to achieve the self-management, first step is to tracking the asthma, where the patient uh, needs to keep a journal of their asthma symptoms and signs, and track their medication intake um, and inhaler you know, use, and maintain a daily peak flow log where they maintain the long functioning uh, reading each day. And uh, they have to know their asthma zone, which can vary to red, aloe, or green. And also know their triggers and try to avoid that. So medical adherence. So this is one of the most well-known, uh, well-recognized challenge in asthma self-management, medical adherence. Which is, uh, for which the cause being forgetfulness of the patient or the curiousness or the improper use of the asthma inhaler. That is, even they use the uh, medicine, they are not using it properly and it is not effective in health. And also lack of understanding of the medications. Two, we can address these issues through use of various inno innovative or uh, innovative technologies like telemonitoring, tele where we can educate patients through these technologies for various interventions like um, audiovisual intervention or behavioral intervention like reminder and all. So if they say know that their medication is being tracked, they are more likely to adhere to their medication plan. Asthma triggers. So asthma, uh, about 90% of pediatric asthma are allergic, which makes it one of the most common form of asthma. And its uh, trigger can be raised from indoor to outdoor, such as um, <coughs> indoor being animal dangerous mold, dust miles, cockroaches, smokes, and outdoor being cold, air pollutant, ozone, and pollen. So how can patient or how can uh, how can we help them to avoid these triggers? To avoid asthma triggers, first we uh, asthma is a multifactorial disease. So it's not like a generic asthma or the generic plan would um, work for all the patients throughout. So we need a more personalized approach uh, where each patient is treated separately for uh, avoiding of these triggers. To the steps to avoid these triggers are to monitor day-to-day -day symptoms of each patient and in the same time monitor the environment, uh, the area where they live, and then systematically rank these triggers based on the symptoms reported by the patient. And then um, all our patients, whenever these triggers are available, I mean, active in their environment. So the fourth part, the self-management education. Apart from the rest of the things, we also need to educate patients so that they could, um, we could enable them to, uh, to self-manage their asthma by themselves. So this has two part of it. So one is knowledge part, where we 
uh, increases the knowledge or understanding of the patients. Uh, to uh, understanding of the patient about asthma and its uh, uh, its medicine, and we bring positive attitudes towards the medicine of the asthma, and we also teach them the various healthy behaviors, fooding plan or diet diet plan or some uh, healthy environment they can uh, stay on. And the other part is self management skills, where we help them to identify the early signals of asthma, asthma attack. Uh, how to act on these uh, early symptoms so as to avoid the exacerbation and various relaxation techniques. So our uh, our this work is motivated by also by our finding from our existing project Health for Asthma, uh, which is a multi-sensory approach for uh, management of asthma in children. So here um, we collect multimodal multimodal data from patients and uh, analyze it to uh, to get actionable insights. And as I mentioned, it's an ongoing study, and we have uh, already completed, already consented 107 patients, out of which 83 are completed study. And out of those 83 completed study, our findings are the continuous monitoring of uh, patients give useful insights into their health. Uh, poor medical adherence leads to uh, poor asthma control, and uh, different patient reacts differently to environmental triggers. So we need a personalized approach to deal each of them. Based on our findings, these are the challenges we derive. So the poor patient uh, compliance badly affects the quality and quantity of data collection. Poor medical adherence and improper use of the inhaler uh, devices minimize the medical effectiveness in the asthma management. And due to the multifactorial nature of asthma, a generic asthma care plan proves to be um, ineffective in most of the cases. So we need more personalized approach uh, to deal with them. To address these challenges, we need a system that could closely interact with patient, uh, monitor their asthmatic well-being, and encourage them to add medical adherence, monitor their asthma, or monitor their environmental factors, and help them avoid it, and educate patients with self-management skills. So, like a, a system that enables them for asthma self-management. So, chatbot as one such system, how can it help? So it's a conversational system that creates the environment that is available 24-7 uh, with a natural engaging uh, environment, uh, providing more prompt response to the user with a contextually relevant information as per the user input. Uh, it, can, uh, it can take an approach of personalization for, uh, to deal with the patients, and it is scalable throughout multiple users. So these are the few chatbot technologies that, it is, that is available in the market and they are trying to address various aspects of healthcare management. So some are available as a mobile app or a, a, in Android or iOS, some are available in web platform, and some are available in existing chat platform like Facebook Messenger, Slack, and all those things. These are, uh, but none of these technologies are focused toward uh, disease management. All of them are generic uh, chatbots, they are trying to address various aspects of healthcare management like encouraging uh, people towards a proper diet plan and providing online counseling for the patients and uh, providing reminders for the generic medicines and all those. Now these are the applications for asthma management. So these are static applications and none of these are a conversational agent. Though these uh, applications are toward asthma management, none of them are comprehensive for to address all the aspect of asthma management like we are approaching. So they are doing it in isolation. So much towards uh, medication reminders, so much towards tracking of uh, symptoms, so much towards reporting, uh, uh, making a digital journal and reporting it to the clinicians, uh, and so much towards uh, teaching how to um, how to use proper uh, how to properly use asthma inhibitors. So for example, the first one, the mobile game app, will happen. It is. Uh, it is trying to teach a child asthmatic patient, children asthmatic patient, how to use inhaler through game. So the game uh, would require the children to avoid various triggers and use the device so as to win the game or to score the game. And that would teach the children how to um, use the inhaler properly. But this doesn't give any feedback or doesn't collect any user data. So in theory, uh, all these, this is only like, you have to teach the patient only once, right? Yeah, uh, and and the similarly, uh, we have something for you know uh, measuring the lung function, how to properly use that. Yeah. Uh, again, you know similar thing. So yeah. 
theoretically, you know, from the chatbots that we build, we can just provide, uh, you know, incorporate similar techniques or just link to the these existing ones, saying, hey, look, you know, learn these things so that you can. Yeah, yeah we can do that, and also we're addressing each of these issues in our. Uh, oh, okay. As a comprehensive system. So my case statement. So a smart conversation system can continuously monitor patients' relevant health signals, including their medical adherence and environmental data. Through contextual and personalized processing of this data, it can enable self-management of patients' chronic diseases. This particular work is uh, presented in the context of asthma management. What do you think, Dr. Kara? Too much? No. So moving into methodology, where I'll be discussing my approaches and implementation detail. So we have developed Kvert as a conversation system that collects data on patient asthma and uh, uh, patient asthma for a given period of time so as to un understand their asthmatic health. <coughs> we do this by using the daily questionnaire which is acts in form of conversation with the user. Monitors and encourages patients to improve medical adherence. For this, uh, we, we have a set of a customizable medication reminder for the user. Customizable means the user themselves can uh, modify it as per their uh, convenience and use it uh, so that keyboard could remind them to take the medicine. And also we demonstrate how to use a proper inhaler, uh, properly use the inhaler device so, uh, so uh, for the medical effectiveness. Monitor patient's environmental factor and alert potential asthma triggers. So for this we constantly monitor the environment of the patient and mon by monitor we means we collect data and we also check the data so that if there is something abnormal in the parameter we alert the patient through personalized alerts. And educate patients on asthma self-management skills. So we educate uh, patients with various skills and education of asthma management with which they could um, uh, enable themselves for managing their asthma in daily life. So Kvot collects various data about the patient and uh, about patient health and environment to understand their asthmatic condition. So these are the data collected about the patients, their, their night symptoms, their medication use, which is controller and rescue, uh, worsening of asthma, their peak flow meter reading. These data are collected through the conversation, through the chatbot conversation, uh, the day-to-day -day conversation that takes place between the user and the chatbot, or the patient and the chatbot. Uh, I will use user and patient uh, interchangeably because they are the same thing, so you don't get confused. And apart from that, we also monitor the environment of the environment of the patient where we collect data of the environment like ozone, PM2.5, pollen index, temperature and humidity. Let's see how we collect this data. So for the data through the conversation, to collect the data through the conversation, uh, we need to parse the user, user input that is uh, in the form of text. So we use Dialectflow which is an existing platform provided by Google, Google for natural language processing and dialect management. We use this process to parse and process the user dialogue. Uh, let's see how that is happening. So here is an example where a person is saying, I'm experiencing cough and wheeze. So this is a regular text which is given by user to the keyword. Then keyword uh, uses uh, dialect flow to get extract this information, intent, which defines the intention of the user in the text, in this particular case, which is collect symptom. Uh, entities are the data for interest uh, within the text, which is cough and wheeze in this case which might be other things like um, medication use, or their uh, uh, activity limit, or the worsening of asthma, and so, so many things which are of our interest in the text. Then context, uh, context is an um, idea or fact around which the conversation is happening. It is a crucial thing to make the flow of the conversation. So it's pa it passes the information from one text to another in the conversation. And other information like user timestamp, uh, which, uh, which is extracted based uh, on the user uh, input and uh, used for a categorization of the data. Based on this extracted data, keyboard makes a response to the user, um, a relevant response to the user, which, uh, which keeps the conversation going on. That was for the user data, and for the outdoor data, we collect it through third-party weather APIs. We use uh, EPA year now for PM2.5 and OJUN. We use pollen.com for pollen index and open with a map for humidity, temperature, and weather. These data are collected on different frequency uh, periodically based on their availability. So PM2.5 and ozone is collected hourly, that is 24 data points per day. 
temperature and humidity is collected every two hour, which is two days data per day. And pollen count is collected twice a day, which is 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. This data collection has two parts of it. One is data collection, where we collect the data from these third party weather APIs and uh, stores it into the <coughs> cloud storage. And the second part is data watch. So in data watch part, before um, before we commit this collected data into the database, we check that each, each and every value of this collected data for any abnormality or the unhealthy ranges. Um, and whenever these values are unhealthy ranges, we generate personalized alert, uh, which we will see on the later slide, how we will see that. Okay, so Kbot collected all this data. Now these data are used in turn uh, or processed so as to achieve the contextualization and personalization in its approach. Contextualization. So how Kbot uses Asama domain knowledge to provide contextually relevant information to the user. So for that we piece together the information from these three sources, the Maya Clinic, Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, and Very Well Health. We curate this data and uh, store it as a domain knowledge for the chapel to use. Um, this, this task is done under the guidance of our clinical collaborator. And uh, uh, the Kbot uses this data in terms to, to make a contextually relevant conversation. So here an example, um, it's a generic example where Kbot is using the domain knowledge um, to provide contextually relevant information to the user. So the user is say, reporting a symptom and Kbot is uh, giving a response saying that um, the, the symptom might be big because of all these, all these parameters, all, the, all these triggers, uh, which is uh, responded using the domain knowledge. Apart from uh, domain knowledge, we uh, Kbot also uses uh, audio visual content for the, for, to, for the purpose of teaching uh, or educating the patient. Uh, we use video content to educate patients on how to use uh, inhaler properly. And this video content is uh, available from howtoseinhaler.com. They have a standard video to demonstrate the use of various kinds of inhalers. And, uh, for medication images, um, we acquired the image from American Association for Respiratory Care. We use these images to help patients to identify the different medicines of asthma. So here an example where a keyboard is uh, using video to demonstrate how to use an inhaler to the patient. And here is an example where the uh, keyboard is using uh, image to help patient identify the right medicine. So in this particular example, the keyboard is uh, showing an albitrol how it looks like. So personalized. Kbot takes a personalized approach to, uh, to converse with patient and help them self-manage their asthma, where it uses patient's past health, health data, um, like health history, their environment, and their uh, lifestyle, uh, to tailor the future course of action, or to generate a more patient-specific uh, response. So here is an example. So this is a generic chatbot case where a chatbot would, uh, where the chatbot doesn't have any contextualization for personalization. So here the, the user is asking about or asking about weather report. So the keyboard is giving a generic response about the weather, saying it's, it looks like fairly sunny outside. You can use it at all those things. But in the same scenario, how keyboard would respond? So the keyboard uh, adds a layer of personalization on top of the generic response. It is, uh, it is uh, giving the weather report as well as it is also giving an alert where the keyboard knows that patient is already allergic to pollen and when it figures out the pollen is bad in the weather environment or the user environment, it is uh, adding a layer of personalization with a personalized alert saying that because yes, the pollen is bad in the area, you might want to... Have you allowed for um, um, uh, the application to be initialized uh, with uh, some so clinically um, uh, uh, you know, uh, it may already be known the patient is allergic to pollen, so that can be given. Yeah, yeah, that to can the system be itself, right? So then, yeah, then yeah. you can use uh, can be. because not every time, not everything, the system will identify. We are not diagnostic system per se, but we are the you know right now, right? So the idea is to um, uh, take whatever knowledge there is and make it actionable here. Yeah, so I'll come into that. So this is one specific scenario where patient is asking and we're giving, giving additional information with the personalization. But we also continuously monitor user environment. Whenever there is a bad value, we automatically generate alerts. So it doesn't have to be initiated by the user all the time. Mm. 
So how we achieve this personalized sun in the conversation? So we the keyboard follows the same study plan like our K Health app, where we set up an initial user profile based on our electronic health based on their electronic health record. Uh, these are the information we use from the users uh, EHR, and uh, this 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 profile is in turn used to initiate the conversation with the user with a personalization. And every time the conversation happens between the user and the converse, uh, chatbot, uh, this user profile is uh, automatically updated with the personalized data and uh, which in turn is used for uh, later personalization. So if the patient or the uh, user, let's say, is conversing with the chatbot every other day or like several times in a um, week for several weeks, and each time it seems like I have a cup, please take your own withdrawal. So will there be some history that you know now this patient needs to start a control of medication or step up? Can you program it or incorporate? Yeah, so that is there. If uh, the the patient is uh, like uh, taking the control of med I mean rescue medicine for more than four days in consecutive or uh, within a week, so we send an alert saying that you are using control, uh, rescue medicine more than often. You might want to consult your physician. So that's another decision part we can take up on. So we direct the person to us to this. <coughs> Theoretically, we can continue to also monitor correlations, find correlations, and then you know uh, present to you saying, hey, do you want to make this correlation? Do you agree with that? Uh, and then make it actionable. So um, the pollen happens to be high every time, and um, you know you happen to be taking uh, medication. Um, we, when, and we see that correlation, or we can ask it later on, once a month, whenever you want, and then you can make it actionable. And then, uh, ideally, it would be uh, right now. The best I can think of is to say, okay, um, have extra five minutes in your consultation with the doctor to review this. Yeah, and fine. at that point, you come to a conclusion that this is the best action for you. Um, give the note discharge summary to nurse coordinator uh, to you know kind of put in um, uh, the outcome of that consultation and then the system will help you and her or it'll give you alerts for that so for example you could say alert for any of these things and reminder for any of these things those okay. things can be all set up so for this uh, various type of data about patient and the type of use is uh, their symptom trend, their medication list, um, their medical compliance, personalized triggers, and environmental data. So these are the data <coughs> used by Gilbert uh, for the personalization in the conversation. So how we achieve personalization with the environmental data or environmental alert? <coughs> so we uh, maintain a uh, personalized rank list of the triggers. So that means like um, these lists are based on the frequency of the co-occurrence with the symptom within 48 hour window. So what does that mean is, here is an example. So let's say the patient has a symptom or shortness of breath at 5 p.m. today. Then that means, uh, then we will check past 48 hours environmental data of the particular patient and see if which, uh, which parameters are on only the range. So whichever are on only the range, which is pollen in this context, we blame it for the uh, symptom. And so that's a one instance of the co-occurrence. With such co-occurrence, we maintain a list. Um, so in this example, we can see the pollen is, has the highest frequency of co-occurrence, so it is more susceptible to be the trigger. So that, that makes a personalized uh, trigger list. And this list keeps on updating as, as, as long as the patient keeps on talking with the chatbot. And uh, uh, next time when uh, they report more symptoms, the ozone might be on the higher on the top and that might be more susceptible with the future course of action. And with this list, whenever the data watcher, which I already discussed earlier slide, data watcher found abnormal value in the environment, uh, it sends an alert to the patient who lies onto that particular zip code and has that particular trigger in his personalized trigger list. And sends the personalized alert to all, all those patients in that category. So we also measure the we also measure the lung functioning of the user. Uh, for that, we provide a digital pink flow meter with the K Health app, and we ask in the in the initial conversation we ask them to make three consecutive readings of the um, of their lung functioning.
and based on this reading, we take the best value and record it as the personalized, personalized best value of the user, which is personal best PDF. And every next time the user converts with the chatbot, uh, we measure that, we compare that value with the personal best of that particular patient and categorize it into three different zones. If the value lies within the 50% of the personal best, it's in red zone. If the value lies within 50 to 80% of the personal best, it's a yellow zone. And if it is beyond 80, it's a green zone. So with any patients who belong to Aren't your green zone and the yellow zone the same? No, of course. It's a typo, yeah. It should be green in India. Not India, that's it. Okay. Yeah, if it is uh, above 80 or beyond 80, uh, 200, it is in green zone. So any patients who lie, whose uh, PF lies within red or yellow are on... Uh, it could be above 80 and can be even mm -hmm. above 100% of the previous best. So yeah, in that case, we'll update the personal best. Yeah. Yeah, in that case, we'll update the personal base with the new highest value. So if the patient lies, uh, patient PF lies within red or yellow, uh, we uh, we alert them with uh, caution, uh, caution uh, text saying that you might be susceptible, you might get any asthma attack. So be careful. Uh, take your person, I mean, take your rescue medicine with you. And double check control medication is is taking control medication. If not, alert. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was my approach, and for that approach, we need a robust uh, architecture that could continuously monitor patients' health and biometric data, process this data in near real time, and generate quick response um, with all the processing, and scalable over growing end user and their data, and also provide a secure data processing and exchange between the, between the users and the chatbot. So this is our design and implemented architecture of the keyword. Where clients are lightweight, where clients are uh, lightweight um, content chat application, for now it is only Android and web. Primarily it is Android. Web is for uh, evaluation purposes. We can also we are planning to extend it with Facebook Messenger and Google Assistant in the future. And the server is a Python web app, which is designed with Python uh, framework and wrapped with WS CI server. Is there much programming effort to convert from Android uh, app to Google Assistant? Uh, no, so since we are using dialog flow, uh, we just need to uh, have some configuration with the dialog, and they have an easy uh, out-of-box configuration. So it's not that. that's why I, I propose it here, the Facebook Messenger and Google Assistant. Yes, it's easy to do. Oh, they do uh, dialog flow also has Facebook Messenger? Yeah, okay. so they, that's why I use it. So it has a... Uh, it supports a wide variety of uh, platform like Slack, uh, Facebook, Google Assistant, Skype, all those, uh, all those platforms. So the communication channel, data storage, and other things I'll discuss more in the detail. So the services. Keyword has its own service layer defined uh, as for the need of the functionality of the chatbot. Uh, these are the various uh, services defined, the push notification, where uh, the, uh, this service is responsible for generating personalized alert and uh, notifications to the user. Whether data, whether service is used to generate uh, weather report and to collect environmental data. Data collector is used to capture the user data from the user text through the conversation. Email is used to send out emails. Uh, email services like to send email to clinician or to the researcher, or even we can configure it to send out to the parents. The file I/O is to log a raw conversation, uh, the log text conversation of the user for a technical review. And Elastic Elastic is a is a service which is used to uh, operate operate all the database operations like create, operate, delete uh, uh, user profiles or user data. So the data data access and security. Kvert has Kvert has two kind of communication between client and server. Socket connection, the socket that I/O or socket connection is used um, for real-time communication between the client and the server, which is required for the chat conversation environment. And it uses other, um, it uses HTTP connection for other operations like create, read, operate, delete user profile, which is not, uh, which is not required, which doesn't really require real-time operations. And all the communication channels are encrypted by SSL certificates. Uh, and our uh, And 
our server, uh, server and the cloud database data storage is uh, we study now which is private cloud uh, which is within within the right right study university network so the cloud database and the cloud storage we use elastic search or uh, elastic uh, platform for uh, for the storage of the data of patient data or any other other kind of data that the chatbot uses this is a um, Full text search engine, which is based on Apache Solution Library, and it, it is an OSQL service uh, which stores the document in the form of JSON documents. We chose this um, this uh, Elastic platform because it uh, provides uh, because of its its performance because it is uh, it is very scalable and uh, its fast query processing. Uh, it enables uh, keyboard uh, to process the user data in uh, near real time and. Uh, give the prompt response to the user in the chat environment. So the data is not set, how the data looks in the database. So this is an example of user profile. Uh, all the one that is in the red uh, keeps on updating based on the conversation, the base PEF value. And the reminder, those are the two reminders, custom reminders user can save for their medication. And the triggers list that is uh, constantly updated. But there's a personalized trigger list and, list and it keeps up constantly updating as the conversation goes on. And this is how the patient's uh, health data are stored. They are categorized into day, night, and coin. This side is not visible. I mean, this categorization is not visible to the user. It just, um, user just uh, replies to the chatbot through the conversation. This is uh, categorized based on the timestamp. So when the conversation happens, based on that, the, the data is categorized as a day, uh, day reading, or the night reading, or the coin. So the keyboard client. So this is the primary keyboard client, uh, which is the Android uh, Android app. This is custom defined for the need of our um, uh, need of our uh, uh, our implementation. This supports uh, both text and voice based of conversation. Um, the for the voice uh, for the voice recognition, we use Android default speech to text library, uh, which is available natively into the into the more Android devices. And for e speech synthesis library, we use Google Cloud Text to Speech, uh, which use uh, Google DeepMind to generate uh, voices that are more like human likely. And this is the um, that is the primary interface, the chat interface that is used uh, by Keyword to deal with, uh, to converse with the patient. So, what are your overall experience with the quality of I mean interaction with voice? So we haven't got chance to deal with the real patient. So we are just uh, still in the testing phase. Uh, I'll discuss it in the evaluation part. So the evaluation. So we didn't have. A, we are still to get to get a, an IRB approval for this study. So we couldn't access the real patient. So we limit our study with uh, with the clinicians and the commercial researchers. For uh, for this uh, for this evaluation, eight asthma clinicians and eight commercial researchers uh, participated, and the, uh, this is a preliminary evaluation. Actually. So this is not an actual evaluation. This is a preliminary for acceptance of the technology, uh, where the evaluation criteria were chatbot performance, technology acceptance, and system usability. So these are the matrices we use for uh, for the evaluation for the quality of chatbot. We have natural means of chatbot, information delivery by the chatbot, and the interpretability of user data by the chatbot. And for technology acceptance, we have these are the things we measure through the, through the evaluation. So this is our evaluation result where we get uh, we got 16 responses from 16 um, evaluators and these are, uh, for this response we use 11 pointer like this scale which range from 0 to 10 and uh, anything above 7 would be considered a good score and keyboard was able to accept uh, able to get a score of better than 8.25 for each of these matrices um, and technology acceptance was our primary focus and it got a score of 8.5 both of the population. 
So system usability skill. We use this skill to measure the usability of the chatbot. This is a standard 10, 10 item questionnaire skill which uh, measures the usability of uh, any generic system. And uh, it's a five pointer like this scale which ranges from zero to four, zero being strongly disagree and four being strongly agree. Anything above 68, anything, any system that gets above 68 score in this uh, scale is considered to be above average. And Kbot was able to get a score of 82 from each of the population for uh, usability, for its usability, which makes it to be an uh, excellent system. So conclusion, so asthma being a chronic uh, multifactorial disease, accessing it and managing it really proves to be really challenging in traditional healthcare system. But technology such as chatbot can engage with patients in their day-to-day -day life collecting their patients, uh, collecting their data and uh, helping them uh, manage it. And with the use of in-depth contextual knowledge and personalized approach, further increase the effectiveness of this technology to, to manage the asthma. So the future work. Right now we are using only the environmental data to, to understand the user's uh, asthmatic, asthmatic condition. Further, we can use various IoT sensors such as indoor sensors, uh, activity sensors, and sleep sensors, and uh, get an even better understanding of their asthmatic condition so that we could uh, get better insights to manage their asthma. And right now we are using a platform, a pre built platform for the direct management. We can uh, design a custom language model and train it on the real patient uh, clinician uh, data, which would make it more natural in conversation. And uh, lastly, we can uh, connect this uh, this uh, chatbot technology with uh, our existing work that is KF dashboard, so that clinician can have real time insights into patient's health and uh, intervene uh, in their um, care plan whenever there is a chance. These are the few resources. I have a video if um, if you wish to see that. It's not a great video, but uh, it gives an idea how it works. I had a limited uh, content for the video. So, so I played. Yeah, you want to do? Uh, do you, yeah, play. You want to redo the video also later on? Yeah, of course. Uh, I couldn't get the file from Melissa actually. Hmm? I couldn't get the raw file from the Melissa. Okay, we'll get that. Yeah, so that's why I use yeah. whatever I had. shortness of breath. That doesn't sound good. Did you try your albuterol for the relief? Yes. Okay. Do you feel any better now after taking the medicine? No. This doesn't sound good. You seem to be struggling. Medical care if the symptom worsened or last another hour. You can call your doctor or reach out to 911 in emergency. Can you stop? So, obviously, this, you know, I'm not sure this will really stand to the true use per se, but how do we actually go about, you know, calibrating? Like, I mean, I don't know whether we should say one hour or anything like that. Yeah. Right? I mean, so, I think mm -hmm. right now, you know, I mean, I'm just sort of looking at what is the expectation. Any doctor's office, when you call, you listen to the voice prompt. If you have a medical emergency, call 911, and then they go over all the prompts. Yeah. So maybe this uh, needs to go in a little earlier, because as soon as the patient says, I'm not feeling good or I'm not feeling well, okay. 
because then you pretty much from a medical liability standpoint have alerted the patient that you know and then you do the whole conversation or sort of have a little bit um, quick succession of questions because you know time is of a sense for the very severe asthma patients right and um, I think uh, so by default putting you know uh, I think Putting medical, if you're medical emergency call nine one, that we should just get out of the way yeah. anyway, right? Yeah. So that will help you with A, I, R, B, and B, putting it in cl relevant clinical practice. But the question is, um, so you've not delayed care by having the patient talk to you, right? And the question is, how do we go about kind of, you know, like in this one we said, uh, if it persists for another hour. But should it be one hour? Should it be two hours? What, what is that kind of, you know, how do we come yeah. with something? So, so that's a good question. Um, you know, depending on um, what the patient's past medical history is, that's why I was asking you that, you know, if it's somebody that has gotten into multiple emergency room visits, so in, when we load the initial, have you ever been intubated or been in the ICU? Mm -hmm. So that patient, the 911 should immediately come on. And then that patient, uh, you know, should be a different decision tree, right? Uh, similarly, you have somebody who's classified as mild intermittent asthma, is not on controller, and has never been hospitalized. Then you have the opportunity to quiz them. You know, you have the 911 as a disclaimer, but then you go over, okay, did you try your butrol for your relief? Um, if it helps, then you have more time. If it didn't help, repeat your treatment and uh, then answer again. And so you could do three treatments and then, so that's what we tell patients, you know, take the albutrol. If it doesn't help, take it again. If it doesn't yeah, help. you give us an answer. Right. And so I think uh, you could um, start making the decision, the nodes a little more complicated based on the situation, right? And um, when you... Do you think that we should even figure out a way to simply say this is not, initially right now at least, is not for a very severe patient, patients that require frequent asthma based hospitalization. That should just be out of, you know, yeah. avoid any patients of that kind for this kind of thing. So there are two ways to approach it. Uh, one <coughs> is that if you really think about from a public health standpoint and uh, you know, to justify the cost and the um, time devoted to developing something like this. The severe asthma mm -hmm. patients are the ones that it is best suited for and you can convince everyone. You know, these are the ones that are in the hospital all the time, we can help them avoid admission, we can help them. So that's that one logic. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, yeah, you know, because there's like so many patients with asthma, to having give them all chatbot that may be a concern about, you know, well, this is an overkill. So um, I agree with you that, you know, uh, from a liability standpoint and an institutional approval for a clinical project, having that disclaimer that anybody who's labeled with severe asthma will not be as a part, will help with that. But if you want to develop something that's really going to make a huge impact, then the group that you need to help is the severe asthma. Yeah. Uh, uh, but is, I, wouldn't the, if you demonstrate that you are improving the adherence, particularly control medication, you're taking rescue medication uh, with you, and you're alerting them to take that with you, you are taking rescue medication in a more timely manner, wouldn't that itself be uh, very valuable? Would be focusing uh, on you know so you should demonstrating that that this is where you get a lot of benefit um, and even um, uh, help you find at least in uh, for the time being environmental factors that uh, seem to be your trigger triggers. Hey, but do you also get into this regulatory thing, FDA device issues and those kinds of things, as opposed to what we have now, where we inform the clinician or the nurse coordinator, but not the patient. Yeah, so, you know, um, it's going to be a hard sell for the ones which have mild intermittent asthma, which is just use albutrol, right? Those um, are the ones that, if they're not doing well, 
chatbot kind of monitoring, the continuous monitoring can help identify who should step up therapy and who's not doing well. Mm. Then there are patients who are on daily medications, but still symptoms are not well controlled. So uh, it would be value, a different value proposition there. And then the severe group where you could save somebody's life as well as, uh, which is a smaller group, as well as intervene early and uh, prevent them from getting too sick. So the value will change in all these three groups. You could make a case uh, either way. No, how, um, roughly, uh, so uh, I talked with our program manager. This got funded out of his program, but that was because we use this special program, you know, Smart Connector Health. For potentially getting, you know, follow-on funding for this, his program only focuses on critical care. So he says, I really like your work, uh, and he's very happy with our outcome so far. But he says, I can fund from my group only if you make a, you know, prop, an application that focuses only on the critical care. Because his focus, his, his funding is only that would be the severe patients that end up right. Yeah. How many? The question is now, how many such patients there are? And uh, so, I mean, for example, let's just hypothetically posing a question: Do you see us in, us making a case that something like this, saying we already built this, uh, we can test it, uh, you know, with five patients, just like, you know, we right. did, uh, uh, but but now because he his funding is only for critical care. We only take the patients that have been hospitalized for asthma and demonstrate how this kind of technology reduces the hospitalization, right? Yeah. So we have two avenues. One is we do locally and then remember there is this asthma consortium in Ohio, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which uh, deals with hospitalized patients at each location. Mm -hmm. So if to get the numbers, you know, we recruited 200 uh, patients for that project out of data. Uh, overall, I think uh, Cincinnati did close to 700-800 and so did nationwide. So, so it's, I think, total 3,000 or so subjects over the course These of are the severe patients? Well, these are, yeah, because they got hospitalized. Okay, yeah. mm. But uh, they could be moderate or they could be severe. Mm. Uh, and um, so if critical care definition is patients that need emergency treatment for asthma mm. and got hospitalized, that's fine. If the definition is patients that were that bad that ended up in the critical care unit, mm. then uh, it would be a smaller group. Um, did he say about uh, you know, what is the uh, critical care component? Is it all that got admitted to the intensive care? Any way you can define critical care is, is probably will work. And we can really run by him anyway. Well, once we define saying, okay, we understand you are interested in critical care. If we take this cohort and we have so much cohort, will that fly? That's all you're asking, basically. I mean, our current one is just about 100, 150 patients, right? Anything in that size would probably be, you know, I mean, if you, if you, if you have, a, again, a cohort that we can, you know, 200 patient cohort, then that's... Yeah. I think I would propose uh, 100 uh, because, uh, you know, we were very selective in recruiting. Our cohort got enriched for severe patients because when I think Utkarshni was doing her paper, we uh, looked at what is the overall prevalence of asthma and our cohort had at least double the uh, severe asthmatics than uh, what is described in literature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think uh, at that time we had uh, um, quite a bit. Uh, out of the initial 86 or 100, we had a good 20 that were severe asthmatics. Uh, we may have like 30 or so right now. Um, so I think um, I would, if you're going to do one site, not pose more than 100. 100 should be a good number because you have so much involvement, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and stuff. I think because initially it was a prelim one in three months, so we needed a higher number. Yeah. Um, but because it's going to be in detail and continuous monitoring for several months. I would say, um, 
uh, it will be uh, minimum six months uh, rather right. than the, in right. the sense that all the active periods that the patient mm -hmm. is sick. For example, if the clinician decides that he typically has the problem in spring and fall, well then that would be included. What basically? So a, a patient will be either up to a whole year, but uh, particularly for the times where he has been seen. Because, right? You know, end of summer we could recruit them. So we see the fall, we see the winter and spring. Yeah, what three three months you can yeah. have. So, so that way, you know, we at least get the critical period of a allergic asthma and as well as the winter months. Mm. objective things that you incorporate in this, um, so like the steps and the activity level that you mentioned, um, could help sort of, uh, you know, re remove the subjectivity that comes in from a patient underestimating their problem. Now, similarly, when you have the advantage of voice recognition, um, somebody who's very sick will not be able to complete full sentences, right? So, right? so if you incorporate something like that as a measure of, objective measure of how bad is their lung function, their activity level, if you have the Fitbit, uh, and you have the trend where their activity in the last few days has dropped dramatically, okay. then that sort of scales it out. And right. So one, so I think, picking up on that, one interesting thing would be that since the keyboard has access to other data, if the activity has already gone down, you know what to prompt. Right. Saying, I've seen the activity go down. Are you, you know, is do you think is, is it because of your? Um, do you think it is because of uh, asthma or asthma-related, uh, you know, uh, limitations? That would be very engaging, right? Yeah, that's why we want to go there with all other sensors, uh, which mm. is not included. Okay. So okay. So what you're saying is that this one is only the well, uh, you know. Uh, uh, environmental uh, yeah. Fitbit is not included. Yeah. Uh, even the people is it? People is it? Yeah. Okay. This is what the peak flow. Now let's measure your lung function using the peak flow meter provided along with your K Health kit. It looks something like this. Keep blowing on it until it beeps. Please provide me the PEF value when you are done. Two twenty. Your PEF reading shows that your lung function is good. I need some information. I will certainly try my best. How can I help? What are common asthma triggers? Asthma triggers are the factors in your surrounding exposure to which may trigger your asthma symptoms. There are different types of triggers based on how they affect your asthma. Some of them are allergens, air irritants, weather, exercise, and strong emotions. Pick one to know about them. Tell me about 
the allergens. These are substances that cause allergies. If you inhale something you are allergic to, you may experience asthma symptoms. It is boots, boots, pet denders, rodents. No, here you can also give personal response, kind of saying that uh, in your case uh, we have observed. Yeah, we can do that. Mm. So this is that is generic asthma domain knowledge. Yeah, but we can always do that. Yeah. How to use an inhaler? Got it. Let me find something. Here is a video that tells how to use your meter dose inhaler. Click on the video to play it. Special to generate this? No, but uh, this is uh, not an actual data. Like we don't have real patient data, so this is all. No, no. On the test, on this this particular uh, demo, you collected this data, and you are this text was automatically generated, right? Yeah. And the, so it's not actual, but it's for the test case, right? Yeah. So the graph is like a graph is an image for now. So Isaac is working on that. The new intern. Oh, okay. So the graph part. So graph is, is not yet generated or yeah. It has to be generated on the Android. I mean, the client part is working on that. So rest of yeah, the rest of it is from the, the text. Text, text is automatically generated. That was good checks. That was really yeah, but very yeah, good thing. Like yeah. I'm saying, we're interpreting this kind of data. Again, we say your compliance is nine percent, and the other, you know, these things are all fine. Yeah, and I think we can modify this a little. As you saw, most of the asthma patients that see a specialist will have an asthma action plan, right? Yeah. So rather than so you pretty much have that as the resource. So then the patient's own asthma doctor is still in charge and the message is the same that you are giving them and they are. So as per your asthma action plan, your numbers translate into this, 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 oh, okay. right? So, um, you know, your doctor said you could be that you are in this range and you should continue to do this. So. I think uh, if there is a complete um, synergy as well as a um, you know system where the asthma uh, office is also able to review things, in intervene when needed, or tell you that you know, they want something changed, it will make it very cohesive and you know consistent. Yeah, well, it was one of the suggestions during the evaluation by I don't remember the name. From Jerusalem, but yeah, I couldn't get a hands on the action plan, so I will do that in the near future. Thanks. We're done, right? Yeah, we're done. So, in your write up, you've sort of looked at the logic behind uh, most of this, how in chronic disease management adherence is a challenge yeah. and patient feedback. Because traditionally, psychologists that have worked in chronic disease help improve adherence. And uh, it's basically providing the same thing that you're doing through the chatbot, right? Because okay. if you take a clinician and pair them with somebody that understands the patient's concerns, barriers, and sort of does continuing education towards adherence, which is what the, this uh, proposal uh, seems to deliver uh, using technology. And, you know, I mean, so if you were to do the 
follow up study, we probably will put in um, uh, at least a three month to six month period to intensively work with the clinical psychologist and the clinician and the nurse practitioner to make sure that in, for all the expected cohorts, uh, we have very natural communication. And uh, we'll try to, you know, talk in the terms that at the level that typically a patient would, talk, you know, advise the patients kind of thing. So that there may be, you know, even the way this one um, uh, we, yes, you know, we can reduce the artificialness, not completely remove it. Although study says that if you, you should not be completely human like that, patients don't like it. But uh, also not be very artificial either. Yeah. So there are some, you know, happy medium that we need to find. But clearly, um, smoothness of communication, change, we need to change this voice. I don't like this voice. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are a couple of voices that is offered by Google. You can say that. Yeah, so these are the few publications I'm part of. The first one is. Uh, is this study which is presented, which was presented at the Smart Comp 2019? The rest are related uh, to the asthma care project. We'll send you this this uh, of course. Okay. And this work was partially funded by NIH. Few references uh, for the sources <coughs> of this year. Uh, resource. Used. Okay, so the acknowledgement. First of all, thanks to my advisor, Dr. Omishe. Uh, thank you so much for being such a great advisor with such an inspiration. And uh, thanks for believing in me. Uh, actually, you believed in me more than I believe. I used to believe myself. <laughs> an amazing job. <laughs> I, I, I really, you know, a meaning uh, mm -hmm. for master. Were you part of all those papers? Yeah. Wow, <laughs> so, that's quite an achievement for us. So. Yeah, so yeah, with all the technological responsibilities you gave me in the KF especially, mm -hmm. I never thought I could do that after we couldn't lift. But uh, you believed in me, and thank you so much for that. And Dr. Prashad, thank you for all of your guidance and your inputs in the work. Uh, I, I knocked your door so many times during the whole process. You were always available, and uh, you always help us to deal with the problem in a simpler way. Dr. Sharin, I hope she is listening. Uh, oh yes, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, your input was really valuable as a cognitive scientist. Uh, without your input, uh, this work wouldn't be in this stage, especially when you uh, when you help me in the, in designing the evaluation and uh, uh, while designing the dialogues. And that really gave a good thing to this work. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you so much for being so sweet with everyone. <laughs> uh, Dr. Conrad. Thank you so much for your, all the domain knowledge. Um, you always figure out a way to answer all my text calls and all my emails. Uh, I, have a, I have appeared in Dayton Children's so many times with short notice, but you always uh, figure out a way to answer all my questions, give me some time, even in your busy schedule. Uh, thank you so much for that. And all the collaborators and friends from Noesis, especially Revati, uh, in, uh, See, I mentioned as collaborator, see, but she is always more than collaborator. She has helped me in solving every single doubt and issues I had in this group. Whenever I had an issue, I used to run with her, run to her, and uh, we used to discuss for hours and then solve the issue. Uh, even till yesterday, I was discussing with her like how to solve, uh, how to present, and how to put the contents in the slides. Uh, Sriyans, I don't think he's here. Uh, he helped me in the time when. Uh, I was uh, struggling to define my research problem. He helped me to organize the whole thing and how to approach the problem and how to propose a solution. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Kirill, uh, thanks for helping me in the development of the uh, separate client. Uh, we worked for almost a semester to develop this app and we're still working actually. <laughs> it's not complete yet and we're still working. And um, thank you so much and good luck. And we could hope he's here you know, listening to this. I mean, uh, from that day, I joined the Noises till now. Till yesterday, he has been always encouraging me and pushing me towards my limit uh, with all the guidance and with all the experiences he has. He guided me throughout the process. And he's always pushing me. That's what I like. And thank you for being such a true friend. 
and uh, this is the whole KST, um, the faculty, the clinical collaborator, and some graduate students. And our whole KST. There are a few names, um, thanks to all of the friends, but there are a few names I had to take. Uh, I prepared this slide in the last moment, so I couldn't put uh, put up here. Uh, thanks to Swati. Uh, she has been helpful throughout the process, not only through the resource that any issues. She is helpful with any problem we get in the Moises. Go to her and at least she will try to figure out a way to solve that. And she is the one who guided me to Sreyans when I was struggling to define the problem. Thanks for that. And um, Hussein, he's not here. He has been silently helping me from the day I came to know about this lab. I did a project under him in the web, web information system class. He was a mentor for that project. Since then, he has been uh, silently, nobody noticed, but he has been silently helping me with all the doubts, all the problems I had. Uh, th thank you so much, Lucy. Hope you will watch this video. Yeah, thanks to everyone, and thanks to my wife uh, for being so supportive and uh, understanding. Uh, I used to be in lab for semesters to uh, like three, four a.m. till three, four a.m. in the morning, and she has been supporting me in so many ways. And thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Alright guys, we need to uh, hurry up quickly, I have a uh, noon call, but uh, anybody who wants to ask any question right now, quickly, the program committee. Okay. Alright, well, excuse me. Uh, <coughs>